Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, it's an honor and privilege to rise today from the territory of the Nanaimo First Nation and to serve the communities of Nanaimo Ladysmith in the territories of Nanawas, Staminas, Staminas, Lyox, and First Nations. The budget is over 700 pages long, and the Budget Implementation Act is over 300 pages long. So there's a lot of ground to cover in a short speech. I've picked some of the key positive and negative aspects to highlight. A national child care system is a program the Green Party has been calling for for decades. This program is needed more urgently than ever as we begin to address the heavy impact that the pandemic has had on working mothers. The province of Quebec has been providing low cost child care for the past two decades and researchers have studied what's been successful there and what hasn't been. I'm encouraged to see the government supporting a not for profit model. We must not allow the quality of child care or the quality of We have issues with sound and interpretation. C'est l'interprétation, hein, qui est le problème? C'est ça. Um, I think we have to go to my um, my uh, traditional. Um, can you please unplug and replug your headset, please, just to be sure? <laughs> can we try again? Okay, how is that working? Ça va? Uh, just hold on here. Yeah, yes, please. It is working, yes. Okay. Please go Good. ahead, proceed. Thank you. Okay. The budget makes some positive steps towards addressing the affordable housing and homelessness crisis in Canada. Unfortunately, it is not enough to make up for decades of neglect by the federal government. Housing is a human right recognized in international law and affirmed in the national housing strategy. Much more needs to be done to ensure that right is respected. Weak regulations have allowed our housing market to be used by the global ultra wealthy for tax evasion and money laundering. These activities have driven up the cost of housing to unsustainable levels, and they continue to climb. Where does it end? We should be looking at regulations to protect Canada's residential real estate market. Many countries have regulations that restrict foreign buyers. I've heard both conservative and liberals talk about how much they love foreign direct investment. When, when people earning medium incomes can no longer afford to own or rent a home without spending 50% or more of their income, is foreign direct investment in housing benefiting Canadians? Housing prices in Canada have gone up an average of 30% in the past year. We have barely begun to see the fallout of that. The investment in Canada's nature legacy is a very welcome addition especially the funding directed to Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas, or IPCAs. Reconnecting Indigenous people back to their traditional lands is key to reconciliation. A sixth mass extinction is happening right now. Species are disappearing at a rapid rate, and we are losing important and endangered ecosystems around the planet. The endangered big tree old growth ecosystems on Vancouver Island are a perfect example of where the funding from Canada's nature legacy should be spent. Indigenous protected and conserved areas would put land under the control and authority of local First Nations. This ensures long-term economic development build on, built on harvesting second growth forests and creating value-added forest products while preserving old growth for ecotourism and traditional practices. Low-income seniors in my riding have been asking for additional pandemic relief and for permanent increase in old age security. The budget promises that old age security will increase in 2022, a year from now, but only for seniors over the age of 75. This is creating two classes of seniors, those 75 and up and those under 75. This is going to force more seniors to continue working in jobs that young people could be filling. It's positive that the government is moving towards national standards for long-term care, but bolder action needs to be taken. The pandemic has exposed glaring deficiencies in some provinces that allowed for the warehousing of seniors in for-profit homes. Serious action should be taken against private for-profit long-term care homes that use pandemic relief funding to give executives and shareholders a bonus instead of fixing deficiencies. 
The government has made a good start with additional support for students during the pandemic with interest relief and an increase in student grants. But it's time to take bold action to bring Canada fully into the knowledge-based economy. It's time to follow the lead of Northern European countries and make post-secondary education in this country tuition free. The Green Party has long been calling for improvements to our healthcare system with an increase of health transfers and a system that recognizes provincial demographic differences. There's an incremental move towards universal pharmacare, but we need bolder steps to ensure Canadians have access to the medicine they need. We've been calling for universal pharmacare, universal dental care, universal mental health services, wellness care, and a patient-centered focus on health and well-being to keep people out of the sickness care system, because we know that all of these things will save money in the long run and keep Canadians healthier. Small businesses are going to have a more difficult recovery than large multinational companies that have been able to ride out the storm with big box stores and online sales. Small and medium-sized enterprises are the lifeblood of the economy. They hire the vast majority of private sector workers. Special consideration needs to be given to ensure that the hundreds of thousands of small and medium-sized businesses across this country are able to recover. The wage subsidy ends in September. Many businesses in my riding need help well beyond September. This is tourism week. The budget commitments to the tourism industry are not enough. Tourism's contribution to the economy is underestimated. Tourism employs more people than oil and gas in Canada. $500 million is not adequate to meet the needs of tourism operators across the country, especially for those who will not be in full operation again until at least 2022. I hear from constituents like Shelley and Dave who own and operate Cruise Plus, a company that books tours in Canada and around the world. When the pandemic hit, they and their team work hard to get Canadians home and cancel bookings. They have struggled to make to stay afloat during the pandemic. They've lost well-trained, loyal employees and are concerned about the end of the wage subsidy. They will lose support before they are expecting to be able to restart their business in a serious way. The plan to lower the Canada recovery benefit from the current $500 a week to $300 a week by July needs to be re-examined. Workers are still struggling and may not be able to find enough work to compensate for that reduction. The pandemic has demonstrated the need to improve our social safety net with a guaranteed livable income. We're going to see additional shocks to our economy with automation, artificial intelligence, and climate change. A guaranteed livable income can help ensure that no one falls through the cracks as we navigate these new realities. How will we pay for all these things? During the peak of the pandemic, more than 5.5 million Canadian workers lost their jobs or were working half their normal hours. More than half of Canadians are within $200 not being able to cover their monthly bills. At the same time, Canada's 48 richest billionaires increased their wealth by $78 billion and now have almost a quarter of a trillion dollars between them. And we now know that some large corporations use taxpayer-funded relief programs to pay their shareholders and executives huge bonuses. That's disgusting. Canada needs an increase in the progressive tax rate at the higher income brackets. We also need a wealth tax and an inheritance tax for the ultra wealthy. It's time to close tax loopholes that allow them to offshore their wealth and avoid paying taxes. And it's time to tax the internet giants who extract billions from our economy. Big banks and credit card companies have been raking in profits through increased user fees and interest rates they charge to consumers and businesses. And payday lenders are trapping low-income people into predatory loans with terms designed to keep them in endless cycles of debt. This is unacceptable. How have we let income inequality reach this point? All of these things could have been dealt with in this budget. Over and over again during this debate, I've heard the Conservatives call on the government to spend less, a caution about deficits and increasing debt. I agree with them in at least one area. We need to end all taxpayer handouts to the fossil fuel industry. Real climate action requires that we cut all funding to the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion project, cut all subsidies to fracking companies and put them on notice their climate destroying practice will be banned within the year, make the cost of industrial cleanup a non-dischargeable debt so we can stop subsidizing the cleanup of abandoned wells, 
The fossil fuel industry is a sunset industry. It's time to stop propping it up and invest those billions in a just transition to a renewable energy economy. Well, there are a number of things that are positive in this budget. It falls short of dealing with the challenges of our time. We are in a climate emergency and we have growing inequality. Canada can and must do better for people in the planet. I will continue to work towards that goal. Thank you. Questions and comments? Questions and commentaires? The Honourable uh, Parliamentary Secretary to the President of the Queen's Privy Council. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Within the budget, uh, there is a, uh, I would suggest you a historical commitment uh, for the development of a national child care. Um, whether it's coming from the, the Prime Minister, the ministers, uh, or just different caucuses, uh, to push in recognizing the true value of expanding uh, child care in Canada uh, will assist the economy and it will assist many others that would have been disengaged or maybe not had the same opportunity to get engaged into our uh, into our economy. And I'm wondering if uh, my colleague could provide uh, his thoughts in regards to the, the true value of extending uh, child care for more people. Well, member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Well, I, I think that uh, having a universal child care program is well beyond its time. So, you know, the Liberals have been promising this since their Red Book in 1993, and I hope that we we pull through with this and actually make it happen, because I've heard from constituents that want this, and Canadians across Canada have been asking for a universal child care program for a long time, and we've seen it work in Quebec. We know we can make it work in the rest of the provinces uh, by working with them on this issue. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, through you to the member. Um, the, um, I, I, I see that the private sector has a very important part in bringing us out of this pandemic. It will create jobs, economic opportunity. Um, and yes, even corporations will pay dividends, many to seniors to help them go forward. But this member doesn't seem to think that the private sector has any any role. Does this sector believe that there's any value in the in the private sector, as I do, or, or, or no? The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Well, it would seem that the Honourable Member has missed a good piece of my speech where I talked about small and medium-sized businesses across this country employing the vast number of Canadians and how important that is to our economy. And small and medium-sized businesses are very important to my riding in Nanaimo Ladysmith. And that's why I was asking for extensions to the wage subsidy to make sure that we... Uh, protect our small and medium-sized enterprises because during this pandemic, the big box stores and the multinationals have been able to weather the storm uh, by keeping their big box stores open and by doing online sales. And we need to protect our small and medium-sized businesses, and I'm absolutely on side with that. Questions et commentaires, l'honorable député de Berthier Masquinongé. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je remercie euh, mon collègue pour l'énoncé. Écoutez, il a soulevé plusieurs points très pertinents sur l'aide au logement, sur la foresterie, sur laquelle on pouvait investir, les aînés qui sont laissés pour compte, l'économie du savoir, tout ça, c'est bien beau. Il a soulevé aussi, euh, avec justesse, euh, que certaines sommes de subventions salariales avaient été utilisées à mauvais escient. Euh, pour verser des bonus. Si ça s'avère, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec lui qu'il faudrait que ce soit rectifié. J'aimerais l'entendre précisément là-dessus. Les formations politiques ici présentes en cette Chambre qui ont bénéficié de la subvention salariale, moi, je pense que c'est un détournement de fonds aussi. J'aimerais avoir son avis là-dessus. Est-ce que ces formations politiques-là devraient rembourser cet argent-là qui appartient au peuple? Merci. Honorable member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Well, I think the wage subsidy was put in place to ensure that employers were able to keep staff on. And uh, people need to be able to justify, companies, political parties need to be able to justify taking the wage subsidy. It's We've seen it being abused by large corporations, and that's a problem. We, at the very beginning of the pandemic, said that we should have specific rules to ensure that there was no pandemic profiteering and misuse of public funds during this pandemic and and those warnings weren't heeded so we've seen misuse of funds and that's uh, a, a serious problem uh, the honorable member for south okanagan west kootenay short question 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I just would like the, the member from Nanaimo Ladysmith to just comment on this week, we had the International Energy Agency coming out and saying we don't need any new oil developments. We've had the Canadian Energy Regulator saying we don't need the Keystone XL, we don't need Trans Mountain Pipeline. Just his comment on the fact that we are still subsidizing oil companies to the tune of 18 billion and only investing 15 billion into climate action. Honourable Member for Lanaimo, Lady Smith, 10 seconds. We absolutely need to end subsidies for the oil and gas industry, and that includes provincial subsidies for the fracking industry, which you know has had six billion dollars for LNG Canada to export uh, fracked gas from this country. That's going to be a stranded asset. It's going to be wasted taxpayer dollars, just the same way that Trans Mountain expands.